There's a lot of things that didn't make it into the podcast, <laughs> but this is something that these within study slopes, I just think is so helpful to see because you can look at any single uh, within study slope. And if that's all you're looking at, it tells a totally different story. But I think this is really, really helpful just to visualize and see what's going on under the hood. You know, Zach talked about some of the fixed effects, like accounting for how long the study was, the training status of the participants, any other training variables that we would have good reason to believe would also have an effect. Ultimately, ultimately get to a dose response relationship that is our, our best fit model. So all right, so with that, let's get into the primary results from the paper in terms of the dose response between volume and strength gain. So again, refer back to season two, episode one for more details on the various models, the various candidate models. I think there were seven Six or seven, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Seven candidate models. And then on the back end, basically what you do is you say, okay, what best describes the data and what is also kind of a good mix of really describing the data, but also being uh, something that is feasible physiologically. So there, there are various uh, metrics that, that are quantified, and then you can objectively determine that you know, a certain model is the, the quote unquote winner. And in this case, the quote unquote winner is a reciprocal model, which is what you can see on the left-hand side. So on the left-hand side, which is identified as panel A, on the x-axis, you have increasing fractional set volume. So just as a basic example, uh, at 10 sets, if you see a data point, that means that the condition had 10 fractional sets. So you could have various ways of getting to 10 fractional sets. You could have all direct training. So it could be, you know, just 10 sets of what was ultimately measured in the strength assessment, or you could have five direct sets and 10 indirect sets of kind of accessory type movements. Okay. And then on the y-axis, you have the exponentiated response ratio, which is just the effect size that we used, um, which gives us a, a proxy for the percentage change in maximal strength. And then the thickest line that you see going through the, the data points there is the best fit line. And then uh, kind of that shaded orange area there is the 95% credible interval. Um, and then the the dotted line is the 95% prediction interval. Was it 95% that we used or 90? Okay, cool. And those are just various metrics of where we would expect not only the trend line to be with additional data, but also future data points with additional data. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the mean linear slope at the average set volume in the data set. And that average was around 10 fractional sets per week. So basically what we see by that diamond being exclusively on the right-hand side of zero is that the dose response is generally positive. That's just a way to uh, confirm the directionality and confirm the confidence in the directionality. So we can say with pretty high confidence that the dose response relationship is positive. At the same time, we do of course see that there are diminishing returns, right? So we see pretty early on that there's a really strong, robust response, which is what you'd expect when you go from no training to some training. Um, and then you see that it kind of tapers off and then eventually it almost looks like it, it plateaus. But we'll dive into that with a little bit more detail here in a second. So Zach, unless you have anything to add, we can move on to an another way to kind of conceptualize how you ultimately get at this figure. Yeah, no, I think we can go to the next one. The only shout out I wanted to give was, uh, um, so alongside these projects, we also published per session meta regressions led by uh, Jake, uh, Jake Remmer. And one of the comments he got on Instagram was you can't just fit a line to dots. And so True. I, I, I think this is uh, helpful to go through conceptually just to really hone in on what's actually happening. Um, because I think it can be potentially counterintuitive when you just see a trend line and a bunch of dots and the line doesn't necessarily coincide with the dots perfectly so i think it's important to kind of see what happens so i'm going to try my best to take this off the the reins here a little bit and hopefully be able to demonstrate this a little bit closer so here we have a three-step demonstration on what's actually happening underneath the hood for multi-level meta regression so one of the first parts of this process that we mentioned was that it's port it's important that we have studies that can pair the uh, variable of interest, right? So in step one here, you can just see all of the individual data points. And so those are separated by trained and untrained purely for visualization purposes. You can see all of these individual data points, obviously a good amount of fanning, a good amount of variation that kind of represent all, all of the effects in our data set. Now, what people think is happening is that you're just fitting a line to those dots. You, you, you fire up Excel, you fire up something, Google Sheets, 
you throw in uh, a trend line on there like you maybe do with your finances or something like that to to see if you're spending too much on groceries <laughs> and you know what there you go you pretty much did a meta analysis that's essentially sometimes i think what the interpretation is but this is actually what's happening underneath the hood so we have these between study effects in, in this first step. However, each one of those effects belongs to a study. And so you have what's called clustering, or you're creating a level in the data set where multiple effects belong to a study. And those effects have different levels of volume. And so what you can do is you can create what are called within study slopes that are representing the dose response relationship of each effect in a study in isolation. So that's essentially allowing for the within study comparison of volume level A versus volume level B within a given study where all the other variables in that study are accounted for. Load, proximity to failure, intervention, training status, all those things are, are comparable, which is why it's advantageous to calculate those studies uh, within study slopes. Then you can see I have this up here, this little thing called plus shrinkage. And so essentially what a meta regression is going to do, it's going to say, hey, all of these individual slopes, because you're you're estimating those in isolation, it's actually counterintuitive, but having information across other studies can actually provide a better estimate of that study's slope in isolation. This is, you know, can go into this on in a whole another podcast, and I'm sure we will um, later down the line, but there's a, a statistical paradox that kind of sh demonstrates that, where having some information about the group in which you belong actually helps you estimate your individual effect a little bit better. So in this case, understanding all of the study slopes can estimate the within study slope of a given study maybe a little bit better. So once we do that, we're going to adjust all of these little individual study slopes back towards the overall group mean just a little bit. And then that's going to allow us to aggregate the curve or the overall study slope, aggregating all of those individual study slopes into this nice, neat overall best fit line that you see in the primary plots. But it's important to note this important step here in the middle is making sure that the within study comparisons that do control for all the other factors are being respected when we actually compare this overall dose response curve. Um, is there anything I'm missing there? I just, I vouch for uh, having this make it into the podcast. There's a lot of things that didn't make it into the podcast, <laughs> but this is something that um, these within study slopes, I just think is so helpful to see because you can look at any single uh, within study slope. And if that's all you're looking at, it tells a totally different story. And there's a lot of potential reasons why the within study slopes can differ so much. Um, and probably the main one is just general variance, which will be a, a theme probably from this point forward throughout the rest of this podcast episode. Um, but I think this is really, really helpful just to visualize and see what's going on under the hood. You know, Zach talked about some of the fixed effects, like accounting for how long the study was, the training status of the participants, any other training variables that we would have good reason to believe would also have an effect. And ultimately get to a dose response relationship that is our, our best fit model. So uh, at the end of the day, the primary meta regression that you see here and you might have seen on social media, uh, really those data points, you, you can make a case for not having those data yeah. points there. Yeah, we, we've actually talked about that before. There's been a couple of papers um, that have published uh, dose response meta analyses recently that didn't have the dots there. And I, it's I like, think, where's the dots, bro? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's interesting to, to pro and con that because it can lead to misinterpretation, yeah. like you said. And like, it's just, I just hope this... Uh, <laughs> Is clear to the reader that, or the reader, the listener that again, those those dots just aren't really what we care about necessarily. Yeah. Um, they're of course make up the first step um, in the process here of getting to the primary meta regression. Um, but this is why the methods we mentioned, especially in season two, episode one, are, are so important. I I would say if I was not familiar with the field at all or had no like adjacent knowledge and I just saw this, I would definitely assume that you're just kind of fitting the line through the yep. dots. So um, all of that is to say is these are the general steps that are going on under the hood. The last thing to point out here within step three is a, a candidate fundamental difference is differences in training status. The thinking goes that, okay, if I take someone that's never trained before, and I have them start and finish a resistance training intervention, they might not benefit from a given difference in a training program, such as volume or frequency, quite as much, because they're just going to get really, really strong, no matter what. Or you can make the opposite case. Make the opposite case really quick. 
uh, you could also make the case that an untrained individual who has no experience with the exercises could benefit a ton from the additional practice and really hone, hone, hone in those neural um, those neural connections. Whereas yeah. the trained individual may be only getting additional fatigue because they're already um, well experienced with the movement. So you can make Perfect. very valid cases in both directions. Yeah, that's fair. And then yeah, same idea with trained. You could make the case exactly. both ways. Yep. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that a bit. And I think that you know when you see the strong diminishing returns in the main meta regression line, that could be a thought. It's like maybe that doesn't apply to me because I'm I'm an advanced lifter. And and, and maybe you're right. <laughs> maybe not. We'll 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 discuss that some more. But in step three here, you do see that when you kind of subset the data between trained individuals and untrained individuals. So you kind of have a thinner orange line there for trained individuals. And then you have a thin dashed line there for untrained individuals. And what you see is that the best fit model when you subset the data between the two is still generally generally follows this reciprocal pattern. And to be clear, those those lines are those aren't actually representative of like what would happen if you actually fit the data appropriately in each one of those subsets. But they're simply we have done that mm -hmm. and that follows basically the same reciprocal pattern. Um, but those are just to demonstrate the point that they all kind of trend in the same direction. Um, yeah, and, ju and just demonstrating that. Just just as a basic example, if you look at the the line for trained individuals here and. And like Zach said, this isn't necessarily a reciprocal model. That is just fitting the lines yeah. of the dots, but it's just for visualization purposes. Yeah, just for visualization purposes. So that's why I said reciprocal pattern, yeah, and you exactly. said exactly. reciprocal pattern as well. Yep. And like Zach said, there's a lot of things that didn't make it into the, yeah, the hundreds, visuals here. Hundreds and hundreds. Hundreds, and hundreds. Of, of discussions. <laughs> but just, just as an interesting thing here is like we discussed – at the very beginning of the podcast, the Ralston paper, where it subsetted the data between less than five sets and greater than five sets. Yep. Another method that's been used is like less than 10 sets or more than 10 sets. And then there's the Basvel paper. What were the cutoffs? 10 to 20 versus 20 plus. Yeah, I think it was something like that. Yeah. It, it is interesting to look here that uh, with the trained individuals, you kind of happen to see a negative slope from 10 to 20. And then you happen to see a positive slope from 20 to 30. Uh, again, this is not a best fit model. So we're not no. saying that it kind of follows this like what would that even be like an s-shaped curve or a sigmoid curve in a way yeah, yeah but like but basically it's, it kind of goes up and then it comes down and then it goes back up like that is something that would be penalized in the model fitting process and even if that was the underlying data it would kind of be smoothed out because that's almost certainly not what happens yeah but that is just interesting to to kind of recognize yeah. is that even when you have 66 studies and then you categorize it, it's like yeah really clearly strong relationship here and then like kind of negative kind of positive and then you you look at all these effects you're like man this is a mess um, and that's why we focus so much on the best fit curve on the left here this is basically the same information contained in the the diminishing returns table just slightly plotted in a different way to explain kind of what you're looking at here is on the x-axis we have the low number of sets in a comparison. So we're comparing set volume A to set volume B. On the x-axis, we have the low volume there. So let's say we we're comparing 10 and five sets, that would be five on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the high number of sets, and that would be 10 versus five, right? The first number in the comparison. And so what these plots are demonstrating is if the box is colored, that is telling you that that comparison was greater than the smallest detectable effect size. And basically the way that those efficiency tiers operate, um, although not the exact same criteria, but it gets you to kind of the same point, is the point in which the quote unquote plateau occurs or five to question mark in the efficiency tiers is you're basically just counting the final row where there is no longer any colored squares. Uh, basically right here. Which is five, yeah. exactly. So on the left, we're saying that the plateau is five, yeah. right? <laughs> However, when you flip over to the comparisons versus a null point estimate, or in this case, let's compare the differences between the two volumes versus zero, the differences are small. They're not exceeding our smallest detectable effect size, but they're very precise. We have a ton of data for strength, and we have a, a best fit model that fits pretty darn well. The precision of the interval width on those on those estimates in the main meta regression table are really, really narrow. So when we compare all of those differences against zero, every single one of them exceeds zero. So the effect may be very, very small. So this is where the whole um, statistical significance versus uh, practical significance or clinical significance, you could, you've could you heard that distinction before. That, that's basically what these two different graphs are, are kind of demonstrating. The left is saying, hey, is the average person going to be able to quote unquote detect this? And the right is saying, are these differences real or something that we can be confident um, are the case? 
And you can clearly see that on the right, I don't think anyone's taking this away, but this is the reality of what the model is saying is that there is a quote unquote linear effect of volume. It's just that the diminishing returns make the increments of that such that we wouldn't necessarily expect that to be something so overwhelmingly uh, massive um, in the magnitude that we would be able to notice it a ton in practice. So I think this is something that is extremely overlooked in this overall model and saying that, yes, there are very aggressive diminishing returns, but that does not mean that the additional returns aren't giving you anything. Yeah. We are pretty confident they are giving you something. It's just relatively small and, and, and the diminishing returns are relatively large. Yeah, and we can't say with a ton of confidence that in the context of just the fog of war that comes yeah. with research, that it's it's truly happening. But it's just imp basically what we're saying is that fog of war is is quite foggy. Yeah. There's quite a bit going on. And that's why we just hopefully made it relatively convincing that using five as a, a practical cutoff is, I don't think, the best move. For a move. lot of reasons. For, yeah. for, a, for lot a lot of reasons. reasons. But this is the first one. Is this is the first one. It's just fundamentally. Yeah. And, and don't get me wrong, like researcher hat on looking at the the control data from steel. I feel good about our methods there. Like don't, yeah. 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 And and yeah. like, I do think from a, a scientist perspective, I can't say that above about five sets per week, like- It's not giving you a lot. It's not giving you a lot. It's, it's basically the- But I, I, again, going back to a theme that we are, we're gonna continue to mention is just the difference between the, the scientist's job of basically representing the data as objectively and transparently as possible versus science communicator hat on, how do we apply this? What are, what are the various limitations? 